Hello. And I can see Tim and I can see Rayan. Hello and welcome. Um, it's really nice to be here. I haven't done a live in on my own in a while. I did one on Wednesday with um, Darren McGee, which was really fun. Um, but yes, just me tonight. So you know what? Hit me up with questions because I way prefer to take questions than I do to just talk randomly off the cuff. And I can see there's one of you in here. So you got me. Ask me anything you want and I will answer. Ask and you will receive for tonight anyway. It will be really, really lovely. I know someone asked a question um, before in comments on Instagram. I don't know if they're going to be here, but um, they asked me a bit about what schema therapy is like and such a big question because it's so, um, so broad. Tim, don't just watch. Take advantage. I'm here. Ask whatever you like. Make it interactive. It'll be fun. Um, but the question... I was asked was what schema therapy like and it's how how can you describe any kind of therapy is so tailored to the individual when it's done well but schema therapy is really nice therapy um and very focused on what the individual needs and building a really good relationship is what it looks like i can see there's seven of you so come on some of you must have a question ask um So this is a cool question. Could you talk about how to break the cycle of offering yourself conditional love? Conditional love you were given by parents that you now embody and repeat. Well, we, we all learn how to treat ourselves in relationship with other people. And so, you know, what I would suggest is maybe you look at different parts of you that maybe you have a part of you from your relationship with your parents and maybe from other places too, that's very critical or very punitive, very harsh. And that you maybe think about having a bit of a dialogue with that part of you um, to understand maybe where it comes from, the function of the conditionalities. Like I will only show you love if you behave because if I, you know, show you unconditional love, then that's overindulgent, you know, these kind of beliefs that maybe parent figures can have sometimes and how that plays out. And you can kind of enter into a kind of dialogue with that part of you and also maybe begin to nurture. What would you say? What would you say to a friend or what would you say if you had a child? If you do have a child, what would you say to your own child? Would you want them to take this strategy of conditionality in how you treat yourself? You know, how's it working for you? Probably not that great. Um, and then it's about experimenting with actually showing yourself unconditional love or unconditional acceptance, treating yourself well, whatever, not having to earn things, not having to earn the right to go to sleep, um, not having to earn the right to eat something. Um, look at the ways in which you are conditional with yourself and change the behaviors associated with that in some way. I don't know if that answers your question. Help if you want me to clarify. Ask away, because um, I'd be very happy to. So, Rayan, this is a great question, but it's such a big question. What factors determine how easy it is to express empathy towards someone? It looks like it's harder with some people than others. Yes, it is. Some people do find empathy very natural, very easy. And some people find it much, much harder. And I think that also varies based on circumstance. Um, if you are feeling under a lot of pressure, if you're very stressed out, if you're overwhelmed, it's a lot harder to take other people into consideration. Um, all of us have empathy deficits at times. Um, you know, so there's a lot of variability. And I think for some people who really lack empathy or on that very narcissistic end of the spectrum, the lack of empathy is often because there's just no space for other people because the person's so caught up in, I've got to be good enough. I've got to prove myself. I've got to demonstrate my brilliance in order to be accepted, in order not to be rejected, in order not to be seen as completely contemptible. And there just isn't room to think about someone else's um, feelings and what's going on for them. Um, so I don't know. Does that answer your question? 
I'd love to know. Um, and you're welcome. You know, there's not that many people here help. So if you want to ask more um, or ask me to clarify, I'm very happy to. So, ah, Tim, you didn't just watch. I'm glad. I'm glad. The link between narcissistic people and bullying is bullying more likely when narcissistic people. Yes, there's data on this that people who are very high in narcissism or who have narcissistic personality disorder, they're more likely to bully or engage in antagonistic or abusive behaviors than others um, or than the general population. That's not to say that everyone who's narcissistic is going to be acting in a bullying way or that they're going to be acting in a bullying way at all times in all situations. But often I think bullying with um, narcissism particularly, and you know, like narcissism also you know, when you go on the internet and you look at the channels that talk about narcissism, very often I think they're talking about people who are likely very high in psychopathy as well, who are very antisocial, who have very antagonistic traits. And that's not necessarily all narcissism. Narcissism is much more about deep rooted shame and a sense of never, ever really being good enough. And in order to protect themselves from feeling never good enough, they develop a kind of grandiose self, or they've got to be special in some way. And that can be the classic narcissism that we all can picture, which is like the person who's a great big show off, who's um, bragging, who's larger than life, or it can also be what might be termed a more vulnerable narcissist. So someone who is, I'm the one who has suffered the most. I am the one who has martyred myself, the victim. Um, that's another presentation. It can be anything, you know, people get that kind of ego boost or self-esteem juice, as the nameless narcissist calls it, from I, from all kinds of places. And so the bullying is kind of a way of protecting yourself from a sense of being attacked or criticized. So you'll often find that the bullying, the person who maybe they want, they're worried about making them look bad, or they're worried about excelling, doing better. Um, or if they feel threatened in any way, that's when bullying behaviors can come out and is often a way of protecting against shame. Um, so like when people laugh at people's bad experiences, but that that can be, if it's coming from, there can be, there's all kinds of reasons why people might do that. If it's coming from narcissism, that's likely a way of feeling, well, I get to be, see myself as superior because I haven't been through that bad experience. So that person's bad experience kind of means I can devalue them a little bit. Um, so I can feel a little bit better than them because I haven't been through that or I'm not going through that. Um, and, you know, that is about getting self-esteem juice in a really quite nasty way. Um, so that that's where it can come from. And I don't want to say like, everyone is the same because everyone is not, is definitely not the same. Um, so this can really vary. I wouldn't want to say, well, that person who's bullying, this is why they're doing it. But if it's coming from a narcissistic place, it's probably coming from something in that kind of neighborhood, that kind of flavor. So you struggle with the concept of intrinsic value, like intrinsically valuing yourself. I would guess that's come from not having had much in the way of an experience of being valued just by for being yourself, um, which is so hard. It's really hard. If you haven't had that experience of just being loved and celebrated um, for who you are, I think that's that's painful, you know? Um, I think you need to have the experience of being celebrated, being liked, being loved, being appreciated um, is really the way to heal from that. So Dale, how do you learn to accept that I may not have been a narcissistic partner in a relationship, even when I have been accused as being a narcissist? You know, people accuse um, other people of being a narcissist for all kinds of reasons. Um, they've been hurt by that person, um, by other people, and they're projecting it onto a new person. Um, but, you know, it's it's really, I think when people use narcissist as an allegation, it's very often, it's about 
I'm going to accuse you're a narcissist, which means you are the bad one and I am the good one. And therefore I don't have to deal with you. The whole thing, any issues in our relationship are entirely your fault. And I don't need to deal with you. It's a, it's a really very aggressive way to act in a relationship to make that kind of allegation against someone. And, you know, unfortunately it seems to be a bit of a trend that everyone's um, partner or ex-partner who has in any way offended them is now labeled as a narcissist. And that's, that's not a good place to be. Um, and I guess I would maybe also, you know, look at the relationship. Is it a good relationship for you to be in? Um, yeah, you're in trouble. I'll give you lines. <laughs> Hello, Darren. It's nice to see you. So Tim, the thing I hate most about my toxic dysfunctional family is that they said I changed a lot. I'm no, I'm no contact, but it plays in my mind. I know an ex-partner told them a load of lies and they'd rather believe them over me. Do they mean like changed a lot for the worst? <laughs> you know, oh, it's so painful. It's really hard. Um, do you have other friendships? If you have other relationships that you can really pour yourself into, because I think those messages from very dysfunctional families where there's a lot of bullying, criticism and abuse, that's incredibly painful. Um, and I think, you know, when it's always on your mind, it's playing on your mind. I think you're kind of in a really ruminative cycle and I think the best thing for ruminative cycles is to kind of you accept they're there and you turn your attention elsewhere and you pour your attention into other things. Um, so I would be thinking about how do you nurture friendships or relationships outside of your family that help you to feel, to see yourself differently because it's by having those other relationships that you start to see yourself in a different way and you start to have the experience of what it's like to have people who don't just want to believe the worst possible thing about you who aren't going to scapegoat you who are willing to engage with you in a very warm and collaborative way um, I think you need new relational experiences um, which is very difficult to do if you have trust issues and it's it's new to you um and yeah, even more so if you're also autistic and social relationships are tough for you. Um, I would look as well as like, um, are there organizations or groups for autistic people that might be helpful to you? Sorry, my laptop's going to run out of battery, so I'm going to plug it in. Um, you know, are there places where that kind of neurodivergence can be understood and accepted and you can you know, talk to people who've had similar experiences. I think that might be really beneficial if that's, if that's a possibility. Uh, you see, this is, this is old. See, that's, that's your, Ray, and that's your inner critic talking. That's, you have got to achieve something in order to be valuable. So unless I achieve something, then I cannot be valuable. And you've got to break that cycle. And break that cycle by valuing yourself, regardless of your achievements. Um, so, Tim, I'm so glad you referred to an organization. I hope they are helpful because I think being around other people who've had those similar experiences to you, particularly if you've grown up autistic, and especially if you have known you're autistic, I think it's really helpful to just be around people who may be able to understand you and I think by having those relationships you start to see yourself through different lenses you'll see yourself the way they see you you'll get their perspective I think it's so helpful so helpful so I'm so glad you guys have shown up because I was a little worried I'd be like oh I'll go on YouTube and there'll be no one there so it's really nice but yeah I hope I've answered your questions. Let me know if I have or if I haven't or if you want me to say some more. Um, yeah, I'd be happy to. So 
So you've known you've known that you are autistic for two years. Yeah. So that's that's really recent. I'm assuming you're an adult. So you've probably gone through a big, big chunk of your life not knowing. Um, and I think those kind of diagnoses change the way you see yourself and can actually be very helpful in understanding different challenges that you've had that you may have seen through a very negative lens, especially if your family have seen those through a negative lens. Um, I think really getting to grips with what that means for you and how it's affected you can be really, really helpful and actually give you a much more compassionate sense of yourself. So, yeah, I mean, being diagnosed with autism and ADHD in your 40s, I mean, that's a big deal. That's a, it, it, I think I've worked with a lot of people who've had later diagnoses of ADHD and autism. I've referred a lot of people for diagnosis of ADHD and autism. Um, you know, and it's incredibly emotional, actually, to get suddenly get that diagnosis and things that just didn't make sense before suddenly make sense. It's really it's it's very moving and very valuable. So I'm really glad you got the assessment and diagnosis. And I hope it's a start of um, a lot of change in the way you see yourself and the way you relate to yourself. I really hope that's good for you. I'm sure it will be. So, so Alice, hi Alice. I've asked this in the comments already, but I'd love to hear more about certain aspects of being human. Being raised by a narcissist, I'm starting to understand certain life concepts are foreign to me. So what's foreign? What's foreign to you? And, you know, we are all limited by the environments that we grew up in. You know, we all see the world through certain lenses. We have certain concepts in the way that we see things. Um, and I think you can just open up to new experiences and just be aware the way you see the world may not be the way other people see the world. And it can be really interesting to think, how would someone else who has a very different perspective on life, on relationships, see the situations that you find yourself in. Um, that can just be really helpful to just open your mind, open your heart to new possibilities and understand that there are things that you will miss because of the upbringing you've had. And that's not, you know, that's not saying that you're deficient in any way. If you took me and plonked me in India, um, I would not understand the culture. I wouldn't understand the language. So I would be confused. Um, and if you've been raised in a family where there's a lot of very, very strong narcissism and it really colors the way you see the world, being then plunged into the world is a bit of a surprise and people see things differently to you. And just being aware that that's the case and being open and just exploring and finding out how other people see things, it's going to be really helpful to you. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. I'm going to, I'll skip a few comments. I will go back to those of you just to go back to Alice. So the idea of making mistakes, being imperfect, not being valued by your worth. I thought human life was about being perfect in the best. I realize that's now, I realize now that's not quite our human purpose. Thank God. Yes, <laughs> exactly. So if you're really aware that you have that lens, see that as the lens that you put on in the morning and you wake up and you're like, <laughs> I've got to be perfect and I've got to achieve and that's what makes me valuable. And you go intentionally say, that's the lens I tend to see things, but maybe I want to put some different glasses on today. So how am I going to put something on that allows me to see things differently? And being intentional about it. And, you know, you can have a lot of fun with this, actually. Um, you know, take on hobbies and interests and things that you're not so good at that you just do for fun, that are kind of creative endeavors, and just enjoy yourself and just have fun with it and see what happens. And, you know, be around people you know, I don't know where you work or, you know, what the kind of culture is around you. But if you can find little pockets, little communities, it doesn't matter what it is. It could be like a yoga class or uh, an adult education class or a hobby that you're interested in, a choir. It doesn't matter. But where you just 
having a bit of fun together and it's not focused on achievement and just being around that and you know letting that sink in letting that absorb into you I think is really really helpful for just building new experiences of not having to be perfect and of being able to have fun and just enjoy yourself and just to be so let me know is that helpful does it resonate so I'm gonna get up because now it's picking up got loads of questions Rayan, the reason why I hate most of the content about NPD is that they create kind of mythology or narrative or whatever inside which we are trapped. Yeah, most content about NPD is, there are exceptions. <laughs> but the most content about NPD is this kind of mythical caricature of the big bad narcissist. And I actually think it gives way too much power to narcissists um, like there are monsters lurking around every corner and you know listen people with NPD can do a great deal of damage in their relationships and can be very very hurtful at times um, but I don't think they're monsters at all um, and you know there's a whole full spectrum and you know I've known people with NPD who I like and can get on very well with um, and that's fine you know <laughs> You know, and I'm, I'm talking both professionally and in my my personal life. And I've also met people who I would not want to have in my life. And that's also fine. Um, but there is that very stifling idea about NPD. But there are exceptions. There really are. Um, Mark Eaton, Wendy Berry, Craig Malkin. Those are the ones I really like. <laughs> Hello, Polly. It's lovely to see you. Um, just checking how I'm missing comments. Hello, Sarah. I'm so glad you're lurking. Everyone do check out Sarah Cluster B Milkshake. Sarah's so supportive of me. I'm like a tiny channel compared to her. She's just so lovely. And there we go. It's someone with NPD who I would consider a friend. And I like Sarah. I think she's great. So there we go. So, S. Singh. Hi, Dr. Ruth. Is there other categories to work on besides childhood wounding, codependency that you think are applicable to? It was healing. <laughs> Just so much. There's so much. I think there's so much. When, when I work with someone, you know, where they've been kind of in, in a very abusive relationship or they've been with someone who's highly narcissistic, I would say, you know, just, just take stock take a little bit of time to sit back and look at what are all the many ways your different relationships have affected you. Um, where are the things that you're really good at? What are the things that are maybe a little overdeveloped? Um, and what are the things that are maybe a little underdeveloped? And just, you know, think about it and experiment with it. I think this it's, I don't think you can give anyone a kind of three step, here you go, this is your guide to healing. I think we're all individual. We've all had really different experiences and different relationships. So I would find the things that are relevant to you. And I'm, I'm trying to think now of examples. A big one would be assertiveness. I think some people are really bad at being able to say what they, they think and feel. And, you know, working on that in many, many relationships can be really valuable. And also you can almost get the flip side of that where someone goes from being really bad at expressing what they th think and feel and being very placating and people pleasing to then that has a terrible cost and they almost go the opposite extreme and they become really demanding and aggressive. And I'm like, I'm not taking any crap, not from anyone. And actually that's just as unhelpful. So, you know, building assertiveness where you can communicate calmly and gently and in a very straightforward way that, you know, supports your relationships are really, really helpful. That's a big one I see. Self-criticism is another one that I see people just really beating themselves up and having no tolerance for their own mistakes. Um, and sometimes I think autonomy and competence and just being able to trust yourself and go out and do things that are just for you and to enjoy the things that you do for yourself, I think is another one that I see all the time. So I mean, you, you guys tell me, what is it that you think you would like to work on or that you'd like to improve? And you know what? I even hate the term work on, you know, because I kind of think 
you know what are you a project oh, come on <laughs> you're not a project what do you need what what would help you grow what would help you develop what would help you flourish in your relationships what do you want to nurture what do you want to build um and and you guys let me know cuz i can fire off comments in the live but i might i can make videos about them too Tim, you sit back, but you don't have to sit back. No one's the priority. <laughs> so Alice, the idea, uh, we covered that one. Ryan, if you are self-aware, you can't have NPT. <laughs> no, there's plenty of people who are self-aware who have NPT. <laughs> and if you have NPT, you're, you can't change if you. Um, this is where it's not, not helpful at all. It's really not. I think it's a really not a very helpful narrative. Tim, I go on massive hikes, miles in a day, once a week and do exercise classes. I cannot wear myself out, but I try to. Is that the ADHD? Is that the ADHD, mate? Might be the ADHD. Tim, not all people with MPD are nasty. Exactly. There's a healthy level of narcissism, I think. You, I agree. Um, Craig Malkin's book, Rethinking Narcissism, is so good on this. He characterizes narcissism as a spectrum. And in the middle, you have healthy narcissism, which is an ordinary human desire to feel special, to be valued, um, and to have a really positive view of yourself. And it's almost like seeing the world through rose-tinted glasses, you know, that, and there may be many positive aspects of that. If you feel posit generally positively towards yourself and towards the people close to you, um, it allow it makes you ambitious. It makes you more likely to achieve your goals. It can protect you against depression and anxiety because you're just a little more confident. So you're much more likely to pursue things that are important to you. You're more likely to put yourself out there. Um, so that's a healthy level of narcissism. And then um, narcissistic personality disorder is a disorder of narcissism where I am only allowed to be valuable. I am only able to be of any worth if I am extremely special and extraordinary in some way. And you can also have not enough narcissism. And Craig Malcolm has the concept of echoism, where Echo was a narcissist lover and she was cursed and she wasn't able to speak her own mind or you know have her own voice. She could only repeat the last words someone else had said to her. So you know, to have not enough ego, not enough ability to see yourself as special and worthy and being really fearful of being seen as a show off or arrogant or narcissistic is just as much of a problem potentially as being too narcissistic. So we kind of want to be in the middle, middle zone. So Alice, could you touch on an aspect I hear a lot when it comes to schema therapy? What is imagery rescripting? It seems effective, but I don't know how to begin. Is there any rescripting we could do on our own? So imagery rescripting and schema therapy is a broad term, actually. You can do many, many things with it. So one of the classic places it starts is with childhood imagery. So, you know, we ask people to think about what's happening now in the here and now, a challenge they're having, difficult feeling that they're having. And we will ask them to just let their mind drift back into the past to childhood memories and what that brings up to them. And then we will kind of, you know, kind of link those early experiences with the present. Um, and then it sounds crazy to just describe it. It's, it's much easier to do it. Um, and then begin to kind of change the image in some way. So you can have the therapist perhaps join in the image. So, you know, if a child's being abused, you would rescue the child. If a parent's being really critical, you would stop them and maybe confront the parent. Or if a child's being bullied at school and the teacher's not doing anything about it, you might confront the teacher or tell the teacher to take a break or sack the teacher, you know, depending on what the person wants you to do. Um, and you're really kind of trying to meet the unmet needs of the child. So you're looking at, do they need empathy? Do they need warmth? Do they need 
opportunities for autonomy? Do they, you know, do they need comfort? And you give them that in the image. And then maybe as therapy progresses, they do it as an adult. They go in and kind of as a healthy adult to take care of their, their child self. But there's other ways you can use imagery rescripting too. You can use it with recent difficult or traumatic events. You can also use it with future events where you're kind of planning what you're going to do. So if someone's kind of wanting to be assertive or they need to have a difficult conversation, you might kind of use imagery in your, in, to help them plan for that in the future to bolster them up, for example. Um, classic one I do, which I got from Wendy Berry, um, is for people who are maybe needing to go into a difficult situation with someone who's highly narcissistic. So I don't know, they're going home for the holiday season, for example, and I'll get them to imagine they're going to leave their more vulnerable child self at home, somewhere safe, somewhere they're having an enjoyable time. And they as a grown-up, as a sturdy, strong grown-up, are who is going back into the situation to see their family or to face something difficult. Um, and so it's kind of really helping them to go into that situation in their strongest, sturdiest adult self. I don't know if that makes sense. It makes a lot of sense when you're doing it in therapy. I'm not sure how much sense it makes when you describe it to someone who might not have had that experience. But you guys let me let me know. You can destroy narcissistic people now, which is why I'm trying to, I'm glad you're trying to understand them. I'm not sure what you mean by destroy them. Um, so Jacob, along with Sarah and Tessa, are engaged in that fight of unstigmatizing cluster me. And for that reason, I thank them so much. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> um, I'm trying to stay true to being autistic too, though. Definitely a challenge. So, Tim, no, narcissism isn't an anxiety disorder. It's often comorbid with anxiety disorders, which Rayan has just pointed out. But narcissistic personality disorder is an intense need to be special or extraordinary. And it manifests in lots of things like a um, sense of entitlement, a lack of empathy, um, for some grandiosity. Um, kind of difficulties thinking about other people's feelings. I can't remember all of the diagnostic criteria, but those are the kind of things that characterize narcissistic personality disorder. When most people talk about narcissism, they're talking about the kind of pathological narcissism. And in fact, narcissism in the literature is just an ordinary desire to feel special and it isn't a disorder at all. Um, and every time I make a video or say that, I get lots of people in the comments telling me I don't know what I'm talking about, but I do. I do. Um, but yeah, I'm glad you found it interesting, Alice. Um, let me know if there's anything you want me to clarify. I'd be very, very happy to, to do that. So let me know if you've got any more questions and if there's anything else you'd like me to talk about that would be helpful to you. And let me know if that kind of makes sense as well about what narcissism actually is or what it isn't, because I think there's just so much confusion on the internet about narcissism it's just like they're the evil demons people like oh, I don't know, so much stigmatizing talk more about attachment styles especially avoidance uh so i have i did make a video about attachment style and my next one is almost ready. It's really almost ready to go. I've been sending them to an editor recently. So it's so nice to have someone else do all that editing for me, which is why they've got music and um, graphics. Let me know actually about those videos. If you've got feedback about them, let me know. Um, but so attachment styles, again, it's something the internet's confused about. Um, so attachment styles is basically patterns in the way that you relate to other people. And you can kind of think about them being on two dimensions of 
how much you want closeness and intimacy um, versus how much the idea of closeness and intimacy um, kind of terrifies you and feels overwhelming and engulfing. Um, so people who are on the avoidant end of the spectrum tend to see relationships as um, stifling, as trapping, as limiting, um, and as somewhat suffocating. And so they have a real drive to create distance in a relationship. There, And this is not a pathology either. I think it's really important to say that it can cause problems if it's at the extreme, as, as anything can, but in and of itself, it's not pathological. So people who have a more avoidant um, attachment style will tend to be quite adventurous. They're very independent. They can cope on their own, um, but they may be, experienced as distancing and withdrawing in their relationship so when someone gets really close to them they will often feel like overly put on um overly demanded off and then they push their partner away and of course what happens is you push your partner away your partner's like oh no I feel more needy I feel more anxious and then they're gonna say I need you more and then which is much which is then experience is more overwhelming and there is this magnetic pull between people who have a very avoidant attachment style and those who have a very anxious attachment style and people who are on the more anxious end of the spectrum are much more fearful of abandonment and so they're they're very keen to be super super close and they're they're really good at intimacy and closeness but they're not so good at allowing space and, and air in a relationship and actually i think all relationships need some tension between those two poles because you know, you need to be able to see your partner at a distance to have desire and attraction to them. And you also need to be able to be close to them in order to experience closeness and intimacy. So there is, I think, in any healthy relationship, a kind of tension and balance between those two things. But the much more avoided end of the spectrum are the people who push people away. Does that make sense, Sarah? Let me know, because I'm more than happy to talk more about attachment styles. Um, I, I think there's a sort of perception as well that your attachment style is something that comes in childhood when the research would suggest that not necessarily. Um, I think sometimes it does. If you've had very extreme childhood experiences, yes, I think childhood can put you on a certain trajectory towards particular ways of relating to people but this research certainly suggests that we are very capable and often do change the the patterns in our relationships so someone who's very avoidant in one relationship could be much more anxious in another and vice versa and we can move between those those patterns in different relationships um so yeah let me know does that does that answer your question So Rayan saying, behavior can be fought, but labels won't be of any help. I, you know, I, I think labels are helpful only insofar as they help you make sense of things. They're not necessarily helpful to in your relationships. And I think psychiatric diagnosis and labeling your partner as something generally isn't particularly helpful. I think it's much more helpful to understand their history, their past, and what they've been through and how it's affecting them now and your history and your past and what you've been through and how that's affecting you now and how the two of you are coming together and what that's doing to both of you and what's happening between you. So Sarah, I've noticed when I'm not feeling smothered, I'm okay with people getting into my space. Otherwise, I don't want to be touched and I don't share myself either. Yes. That's avoidant attachment style. And I would say, you know what? It's people who are very avoidant need to honor their need for space and they need to honor their need for independence and autonomy. Um, that, you know, that is not a pathology in itself. In fact, it may be one of your strengths that you have that autonomy. Um, but I think what's really helpful is for you to commit to coming back to your partner at some point. So if you are the one who says, I need my space. I'm going to my cave, <laughs> I'm going to do my thing, that you also say to your partner, I love you. And because I love you, I'm going to take the space to recharge myself and I will come back. 
Um, I will see you this evening. I will see you tomorrow. I will see you at the weekend, whatever it is, but make sure that you reinitiate contact because if you do that, you give the more anxious partner a little bit of security that you're going to return. And so they can hopefully relax and go off and do something for themselves rather than just be waiting for your phone call or your text and fretting when is it going to happen or not happen. Um, I think that's really, really helpful. There we go. Attachment styles in one minute. So my view on the DSM-5, the way it describes superficial traits only for diagnostic criteria. Yeah, it's kind of, I, don't, I need to ask Alan Francis this question really. Um, I think, you know, the DSM is a diagnostic manual. So its goal is to kind of pin things down to quite narrow traits that can be clearly observed and say so this is what the diagnostic criteria are. But I think particularly for diagnosing personality disorders and differentiating different types of personality disorders, I think you really need to have some understanding of the psychological workings. So I personally prefer the alternative criteria um, that is in the DSM, um, five for narcissistic personality disorder. I think the alternative criteria, which actually focus much more on the self-esteem dysregulation, the kind of flipping between grandiosity and feeling like the worst person in the world, um, that kind of grandiose vulnerability switching, I think is really, is, is much more helpful in, in identifying what narcissism or what pathological narcissism is. So Alice, being mindful of sharing the spotlight, thank you for taking the time to answer my questions. To clarify, with imagery scripting is effective because going into your past and studying childhood problems is the best technique. I wouldn't say it's the best technique or it's the most powerful technique. They're all tools in the toolkit. You know, it is a it's quite an emotional technique. Um, it kind of does bring up big feelings, which is why we do it in some way, because you want to help people um by helping them experience those feelings in a way that's contained and safe um so it is a powerful technique but i wouldn't say it's the most powerful technique and nor should it ever be the only technique in the toolbox because you know there's a lot more to life than what's happened in childhood so i think it's a really helpful strategy but it's by, by no means is it the only one let me know to answer Yeah, let me know if you guys have more questions or I might wrap up. Because it's been really fun to talk to you all. You're welcome. So I will wrap up there, but it's been a pleasure to see you guys and hopefully I will see you again soon. I'm going to try and do a live most Sunday evenings at this kind of time. So hopefully I will see you again next week. You guys take care. Bye.